Good morning. Welcome to Glazing with Amico. I'm Kara. And hi, Debbie. And today I, um, I'm, I'm back to peacock glazing. And I know that I've talked about this before and I've glazed, uh, you know, with the peacock style of, of glazing. Uh, and I really enjoy it, but my idea was that, so we, we do a lot of it on bowls so that it doesn't run off of the pot, but I really wanted to try it on uh, a vertical external surface. So I started with this, and this is my traditional with uh, tourmaline dots and honey flux, fuse, and then the whole thing is covered in ancient copper. I'm going to switch over to my in screen. And I'm not sure if you can see, but I got some blistering. And I don't think it was because this was over fired. I think it was because of the glaze that I chose as a liner. So I did some more testing. And I liked how this looked a lot. You know, really, really beautiful, and it didn't run off. But I also kept it pretty high up. So I did some other tests, and you can see some of them here, with some other covering glazes. And I also did uh, a vase where I used HF9 as an interior glaze because in my testing, I've found that it works really well as an interior glaze when you have a lot of things going on on the outside that might blister. And when you are mixing lots of different glazes, you are going to have more tendency to blister. So here, this is my test tile, and this is my pot. And you'll notice that there's more running on my test tile. And that's because my test tile is fired to cone six. And I decided to fire the, the vase to cone five. I think I'm going to refire it because I, I'd like to get some more movement. And I'll talk about what these combos are in just a moment. In the meantime, do we have any questions? Good morning, Janet. Good morning, Bill. Uh, Mirinda and Betsy. Hi, everybody. I'm glad you could join me today. So this is my, uh, my favorite combination for the dots and the U's is PC27 tourmaline for the dots and PC17 honey flux for the U's. And then these tiles that I have in front of me are a variety of top glazes. So this one is, let's see, oh, yep, that is uh, PC26, that is Blue Lagoon. And you can, let me see if I can zoom in here. So that has, uh, Blue Lagoon tends to be kind of runny, but it has this beautiful visual texture that interacts really beautifully with the, the honey flux, but it does kind of uh, hide the tourmaline a little bit. Then this one is Iron Luster, which is one of my favorites as a base glaze, but I thought it would be nice to give it a try as a top coat. And you can see it did some interesting things here. It did run a bit. It didn't come right off of the tile, but it did come pretty darn low. And I would worry about putting this on a vase where it might just get really fluid. And yes, these these are flat tiles, but they were fired uh, they were fired upright so that I could see how the flow would happen. Uh, this one is Textured Turquoise PC25. And again, this has just a beautiful visual texture, but it's a little different from Blue Lagoon. A little bit greener and it breaks really beautifully. You can see the tourmaline nicely. The Honey Flux uh, also flowed quite a bit, but uh, that, was a, that was a good candidate. But I really liked this one. And this one is um, Glacier. Now, where did I put it? C19 Glacier as a top coat. 
And part of my reason for trying out a celadon as a top coat is because the celadons are really, really stable. Hi, Kathleen. And I thought that that might work uh, as a top coat because it wouldn't run as much. And it did run a little bit, which is why I decided to try this at cone 5. But I think that it would be fine at cone 6, too. So, hi, Nella. Um, Nila, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to mispronounce your name. It's The font is a little odd on my computer. Uh, but uh, this... The, the Glacier would be a good option. Another great option would be Ice, which would be even paler. But anything in the Celadon line that's kind of transparent, so you could use um, Jade, you could use Aqua, uh, you could use Pear. Pear would be really beautiful. And you could also mix them with Mixing Clear to make them more translucent if you wanted to do that. So I'm going to talk about that today. I'm also going to talk about how I got the HF9 inside my vase, since obviously I did not put a brush in there. So I'm going to go back to my end screen so you guys can see. So, yeah, the favorite is the Ancient Copper. It's so, so beautiful. And you can use this technique with the Ancient Coppers, too. It does not have to be done with a Celadon. But the first thing is talking about how to get my glaze inside. Now, my glaze in the jar is a little on the thick side for pouring. So I have a uh, jar. This jar of HF9 is not my usual. And I do not have my Sharpie. Usually I have a Sharpie at my desk. No, it's okay, David. Thank you. Did you address that question from you? Uh, I I the green and blue color that's transparent. Yeah, yeah I was talking about celadons. And um, so I'm just going to add a little bit of, let me show you, steam distilled water to my HF9 zinc free clear. Close it up nice and tight. You notice that when I shake my jar of glaze, I put my finger on top. I'm sure that you guys have done this too, but I have certainly been coated with my glaze because I was shaking it and the lid wasn't on all the way. Everybody's done it. So that thinned it. I am going to mark this jar that it has been thinned for pouring. So I have my, my vase. And you'll notice that as I pour, it is still fairly thick. It's not as thin as what some people might be accustomed to as a studio dipping glaze. And I don't fill it up all the way. I'm just going to roll it. And as I roll it, I pour it back out. Here, let me show you on the selfie. You can maybe see that a little better. As I roll, it pours out. And that's it. I'm not going to do multiple coats. One poured coat. But by turning and pouring as I turn, I get all of the interior nicely glazed. And then to make sure that it doesn't get too thick in there, like in the bottom, I actually am going to let it sit upside down. Now, I'll shake it out as much as I can but I'm going to let it rest upside down on my desk over in the corner. And yes, it will get glaze all over my desk, uh, but I can clean that up. And then I'm going to mark this jar that that is for dipping or pouring, not for brushing, because I've thinned it and it may not go on quite as well. So while that is drying, because that's going to absorb a lot of water, I'm going to do my dots for my tourmaline. So I have a variety of brushes, and my favorites for doing the dots, I have this little one. Yes, 
I have more questions. So you can you you can try out different things for dots. I haven't I haven't tried a lot of different things, and you'll notice I'm kind of going back and forth so I can get as evenly spaced as possible, but I'm not going to be too fussed if they're not perfect. So There we go, there's my dots. I'll let those dry and then I'll do a second coat of dots. And while that is drying, I get out another brush. And this brush is one of my favorites for applying glaze uh, in lines. So last week, while I'm doing this, I'm going to talk about how last week I was in the Q&Amico uh, video. I was layering uh, storm and snow on a plate with koi fish, and the glaze was not dry enough for me to apply the the spots to the koi fish. So while this is drying today, I'm going to go back and put those spots on for those who did not get a chance to see that because I couldn't uh, couldn't put it on earlier. So uh, it's just all celadons and then I'll fire it this week and I'll share it in next week's uh, Q and Amico. Now, uh, just to remind everyone who's joining us today, uh, Q&Amico has moved back to Tuesdays. It was on Mondays for a while, but uh, it was difficult for us to do that with our schedule, and uh, I felt like I was missing some people. So just to keep things even, this is just going to be every Tuesday, and we'll alternate glazing with Amico, which is where I have a specific uh, demo going on about glazing and Q and Amico which is much looser and where I may talk about different things and I'll be glazing but it's really a time for you to ask me any kind of questions that you might have about glaze or about Amico uh, products just anything yes Evelyn you were the one who was asking me about the spots on the koi fish I, I believe, and uh, yeah, I, it's going to be very loose, but now that it's nice and dry, I can do that. Uh, Neela asked if textured turquoise is a transparent glaze. It, uh, Neela, textured turquoise is not a transparent glaze, but it's not opaque either. It's kind of translucent, and it does break on the edges, so where you have texture, it will break and you will see that texture showing through. But if you have it, and it, I believe it will show like underglaze, if you put it over a black underglaze, there's all my U's in a nice little pattern. Uh, it will show underglaze, but not particularly well. If you're looking for a PC that is in that family of, of glazes, uh, you might want to try either dark green, PC45 dark green, or PC40 true celadon. Those are, those are transparent glazes. Most of the PC glazes are opaque or semi-opaque, translucent glazes. They are not, they're not really meant for uh, showing detail underneath. over a base glaze and in this case why wouldn't you? Uh, I could, I could. Um, I just started out doing it as a underneath and it showed up really nicely. Um, 
but certainly it would work. Uh, the honey flux and tourmaline would work over the celadon just as well as under. So I think actually I'm going to do some tourmaline dots underneath as well. I don't know if you've seen this question from Els, but I can't really make sense of it. Um, I will. I, I don't think I saw that. Let me see. Ah, yes, I found it. Um, to make glaze with powder, like textured turquoise, do you have tips? Uh, Els, the, the PC dry glazes have been discontinued, but if you have, uh, if you have any questions about them, we have uh, videos and the how-to on how to mix the dry dipping glazes on our website. Go to amico.com and click resources and uh, in the search bar put in dipping and it will guide you to the instructions and videos on the dipping glazes and if you follow those instructions they will work however keep in mind the dipping glazes are not meant for layering so you could do this with a dipping glaze on top of the brushing glazes which this is a really good technique for so if I had the dipping uh, if I had the dipping glacier this would be a great way to do it you do not want to put the, the brushing glazes on top of the dipping glazes because the dipping glazes will peel off. They do not have the gum in it. So uh, that would be my recommendation if you're making glazes. Um, all of my tips are in those videos. All the information that I can uh, share with you about how to use the dipping glazes, the dry dipping glazes, is on that page. And I will put a link to that uh, after we are done. I'll put a link in there. Uh, Nicole said, do you have a PC glaze you would recommend for speckled clay, especially Laguna WC608? And I'm not familiar with WC608 specifically, so I don't know. Um, but a lot of the, a lot of the uh, uh, PC glazes look great on speckled clays. Um, I like the satin mats on speckled, speckled clays. Those are my favorites for using speckled clays. So I'm going to switch gears here briefly, move my cup out of the way. And you can see that I have a plate and it is white and it has underneath it, uh, this has not been fired yet, this is the raw glaze. So this is snow and underneath the snow is storm and you may be able to see the outline of the fish faintly very very faintly it's hard to see i can only it doesn't look different color wise but i can see it because it's slightly uh embossed looking i guess is the word i'm looking for but it's hard to see with our light we have such good lighting <laughs> that there you go there i think you can see the fish now so what I'm going to do is I have my celadon poppy and my celadon charcoal. And where the fish is, it's just going to come out white. So what I'm going to do is, is I want my koi fish to have some spots on it. Let me get my small brush out again. So I have the C5 charcoal. C5 charcoal, and I'm going to just make some kind of irregular spots on the fish. being careful not to go into the water area just on the fish. 
So those will come out gray, a charcoal gray. And then the next color is C55 Poppy. I've got some poppy, dry bits of poppy on there. And with the poppy, I will make some more shapes. And poppy comes out kind of an orangey, reddish color, which I think is perfect for koi fish. And I'm applying this fairly thickly, so I'm not going to do multiple coats. But uh, if you are brushing it on thin, you may want to do multiple coats. So that's it. So then my fish will have some markings on it like a koi fish. And I will fire this to cone five. Oh, I got a little bit of poppy where I didn't want it. So I'm going to use my tool to gently scrape that off. There we go. So that's ready to go in the firing. And that'll go in this week, and I will share that on next week's Q&Amico next Tuesday. Now this is still wet, but it's dry enough that I can clean up, clean up that edge. I don't, I want the blue to be all the way up to the top and maybe inside a little bit. There we go. So now it'll be ready to do the outside. Now on my other cup, I'll do the, actually I could do that now. Moving things around. Now I just have to be careful not to touch, not to touch the still wet glaze. Especially with my glazed hand. Oh, almost, come on. There we go. Now I could have brushed this, it would work. Okay, so I'm going to let that sit upside down. Again, I do that so that it, it doesn't get too thick in the bottom. And I can clean off the table when I'm done. So when that is all dry, I'm going to go back and put glacier on the whole thing. So let me, uh, Niella, some glazes seem to be thick and what can I thin them with? I'm new at glazing and pottery. Well, Niella, uh, we recommend that if you need to thin a glaze, you can add some, uh, you can add some distilled water, like I said, to, to thin it for, for uh, pouring. I added distilled water. You can add distilled water, and if it's thickened because it is older, I really recommend, highly, highly recommend that you add gum solution at the same time because your glaze may not uh, stay on the pot. The gum solution help, helps the uh, glaze to stay adhered. It also slows the drying time. I'm going to decorate this one the same way. Uh, it slows the drying time. 
and helps the glaze brush on. But when it degrades over time, as, as glazes get old, the, the gum solution uh, can just get eaten by bacteria. It gets old. It doesn't work as well because it is organic. And uh, you may need to add more so that the glaze behaves the same way. So if you some glazes, like oatmeal, are thick anyway. They just thicken as time goes on. And in those cases, yes, you'll need to add gum solution as well as water. Some people will recommend that you use uh, deflocculants like Darvon or sodium silicate to thin your glazes. And while yes, that will make your glazes more fluid, it will also make your glazes likely to hard pan. And then you have to dig your glaze out of the bottom of the jar. So that is why when I get asked about using deflocculants on glazes to make them thinner, I do not recommend that. Uh, Jody had a question. She says, I had trouble when I poured one glaze inside a mug and five glaze coats on the outside. Her mugs cracked when she filled them with boiling water. That uh, it may be a mismatch between the glazes on the outside and the glazes on the inside, or it may be uh, a clay issue. Were these, uh, if these were slip cast, uh, those can especially be fragile, especially when you have glazes with very high tension. We've specifically noticed that if you put, uh, if you're using slip cast clay, which tends to be thinner than wheel thrown, uh, and you use ancient copper on the outside, that you are very, very likely to end up with uh, pieces that crack, sometimes even before uh, as soon as you get them out of the kiln. And it has nothing to do with cooling the kiln slower. I've heard people say that, but that is not the problem. Uh, it is simply that the clay body cannot handle the stress of the glazes. And if you're using large amounts of glaze on the outside, especially glazes that have, that are very, uh, have a lot of tension to them, they can just crack your pot. She's saying that they're hand dried. That that's quite possible. I've had um, somebody told me that they had some hand thrown pieces. They were thin, but they were hand thrown uh, pieces that cracked when they had. I think it was ancient jasper on the outside and oatmeal on the inside, and I would say that that is simply the clay and glazes are not holding up well to the tensions. So I would recommend that you do some testing, maybe try doing each of those outside glazes individually on a pot and see, uh, on a, a variety of pots, and see which, uh, if any of them specifically are the issue. She was wondering um, what white glaze you would suggest as a liner. Uh, if you're using a white glaze as a liner, that might be part of the problem because they do have uh, a lot of tension happening. I really like snow as a liner, sell it on snow, but any white, any white glaze uh, is going to have more uh, tension issues than a clear glaze. So if you want to have a white interior, what you might want to try is uh, yep. is uh, 
using a white slip on the inside and then putting a clear glaze on it. That may help uh, because white glazes are going to have less shrinkage and uh, you can have you can have dunting because of a white glaze if your clay is very very susceptible and you have a tight glaze on the outside um, think of it as like clothing and uh, certain materials give and certain materials don't uh, let's see Uh, Neela asks, let's see, in the last four months I've bought at least 38 Amico glazes. How long does glaze stay good or does it expire? So Neela, uh, we formulate glazes with the plan that they have a shelf life of at least three years. Now some glazes when they reach that three years they still work perfectly fine and there are many glazes that will work just just as well after 10 years what they may do is thicken some glazes however do have uh, more of a shelf life issue and uh, off the top of my head the only one that we still have in production that I know that has a shelf life and it's about three years uh, after which it it will harden and you cannot really use it again is saturation metallic PC1 and it can stay good longer uh, but I have found that definitely at five years uh, I had a jar that had hardened and no amount of gum solution made it usable but that is an extreme case and uh, like celadons for example I have not ever found that there's a point where they uh, go bad uh, and most of our glazes, I have not found that that is an issue. Um, they may thicken, like I said, over time, but they don't, they don't go bad. We try to avoid using materials that will be an issue for longevity. Now, oatmeal will thicken, but it still works. It just gets really, really thick, and it's hard to apply. So I'm going to see. This is still pretty wet, and I don't... I. Do not want to apply the glacier while the other glazes are still wet. So I may have to just leave you guys today and I will bring these in next week when I get the glacier on. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I will apply two coats of glacier to the area that has the dots. And then I'll apply three coats of glacier to the rest of these two pieces. So it'll be more blue here, and then it'll be thinner there so there's less running. And then I'm going to fire them to cone six, and I'm going to refire this one to cone six too, so that I get more movement. Because I really like the colors, and I really love how this tile came out. So I want to, I want to recreate. So I will see you all next Tuesday. Thank you for joining me today on my glaze adventures. And uh, I hope that you have a great week. Have fun with clay. And if you have any questions, just drop me a line at Amico Brent. Thank you.